Um, okay, so I'm going to mute myself on Discord. Um, all right, so let me know if uh, you guys can still hear me uh, on the stream. Uh, just paste in the... Excellent. Not too loud. Okay, just checking. So, um, all right, so we got the stream going. We'll just, uh, yes. Uh, they're on the Canvas main page. Yeah, so you can just copy and paste uh, those links there uh, or tell him to go to Canvas, and they're right there. So uh, the YouTube link uh, is where... Uh, so Twitch will save uh, copies of the streams for 14 days, uh, and then they'll disappear. Uh, so YouTube is where I'm going to put them uh, permanently uh, so that you can get to them whenever. Uh, but for 14 days, you can go to either Twitch or YouTube. It doesn't really make much difference. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. All right, so we got nine people in the stream, it looks like. Um, and how many people do we have? Uh, got a bunch of people online here, so we're missing, uh, missing, missing a fair number of you guys from the stream. All right, we're up to 13. So, um, yeah, one of these days uh, we'll have to, I'll have to find out when uh, Dr. Dunaway teaches and uh, we can start raiding his channel and, like, learning some econ or something like that, which would be kind of amusing. Uh, uh, so, no, that's fine. I want to make sure everybody's actually here because uh, we got stuff to do. So, um, let's, uh, so how's everybody doing today? So you can speak in Discord or type in either chat. Okay, doing good. Um, so, yeah, what, uh, what's everybody kind of thinking about the whole, uh, surprise we're going online only for the rest of the semester? Lots of CSGO. Awesome. Uh, I don't know. Totally not an inappropriate name. Oh, this was our princess. Fishing. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mike, that's a fair, fair question. Um, I'm still kind of thinking through that um, because, of course, it was just yesterday afternoon that we all found out that this online thing was going to be for the remainder of the semester, not just uh, two weeks. So I've got a little bit of uh, thinking to do, and um, um, I've got a couple ideas, but uh, we'll just have to, to kind of go... Why does my voice sound so slow and so deep? Is it just because it's a recording of me? I don't know. Um, though, to be fair... Um, okay. I hate... Uh, well, I'm actually using a wireless mic, so there's no unplugging to be had. But um, No, I think it's partly just recording and... Uh, uh, by the way, I hate the way I sound when I listen to myself. I don't know if you guys have ever had this, uh, but like, um, uh, I always feel like when I listen to a recording of myself, I sound like a complete idiot. And I think, um, so how is it my students can like stand to come to class because I sound like a freaking moron? Does anybody else feel that way? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, all right, well, let's get to it with the uh, the work for today. So um, last time we were looking at uh, Scratch, so let me get, uh, get that window open. And um, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, let me resize this. Um, hang on one second while I get the window resized so that you guys can actually see it. Okay, so there we go. All right, so we got Scratch open, and um, the uh, what we were looking at last time was how to do... Um, well, let me load up the project we had from last time. Okay, so this is Untitled 15. All right, so here we were, and I think I'm going to try and blow up the... This a little bit. Does that look better? Okay. Uh, all right. So this may be a little bit too big, but whatever. Uh, it'll be a little easier to read. Uh, okay. So uh, the last time what we had done was we just had a uh, kind of a stupid uh, thing where the cat and the dog are going to move, and then um, the dog will make some noises as it moves, and that's kind of where we stop. So let's just uh, recap the code for the uh, the cat, and you can tell that it's the cat because it's got the little icon at the top right, is um, uh, repeats the process 10 times, and the process is move 10 steps, switch costumes so that it looks like the cat actually is animated, wait a second, and then the dog is doing something similar, except we were trying to be kind of fancy and make it so that the dog, uh, because the dog had three costumes, only switch between um, uh, only switch between the A and the B costumes. And then uh, when the process is finished, switch to the, uh, the sort of surprised costume, which is what it is currently. All right, so if I run this, then that's what we've got. And the counter is running. And yay, this looks really exciting. And the dog will keep going until it hits 101 in this case um, because it repeated this uh, 100 times and we started the counter at 1. Okay, so uh, at the end last time I put in uh, this sort of heart-shaped candy thing, and so let's do something with that. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, rather than repeating um, a specific number of times, uh, I'm going to take the dog's code, and I'm going to sort of snap these parts out of it, and I'm going to replace the repeat loop with a repeat until. Okay, And uh, what that will do is, so right now, if I run this, the dog's code would run forever. And the reason is that I haven't put anything inside the little pointy socket. And just as a reminder, things that go in a pointy socket are things that are either true or false. Um, so, you know, the the dog is either touching the uh, the candy or it's not or a number is either equal to zero or it's not. Uh, so pointy things are logical, and an empty pointy thing is always false, uh, because there's nothing there. Uh, so if we were to run this, the dog would just keep doing its process forever and ever, which is not necessarily what we want. Um, OK, so let's go back to the dog. So let's make it so that when the dog uh, repeats the movement procedure until it touches the um, the heart candy, and then let's see if the heart candy has uh, different costumes. Okay, it does. So uh, so what we could do here is we could take the dog, and we could say switch costume to dog C. So if I run, oh, I sorry, I need to put the touching in. 
uh, okay, the, so this touching we're going to get with the sensing. Um, and there's a couple different ways that you can tell whether or not something is touching something else. You can do it by color, uh, or you can do it by object. So, for example, you can ask, uh, am I touching another object? And in this case, we're on the dog's code. The dog is always touching itself. Um, it, you know, so you can't, it's no, uh, there's no reason to ask, am I touching the dog, but I could ask, am I touching Sprite 1, which is the name of the cat's object, uh, or the heart candy. So let's put this here in my little socket, and let's change this to heart candy, and then let's see what happens. Okay, so we'll run that, and just, I'm going to speed up his, um, his movement a little bit so that we're not sitting here forever. Um, okay, so I made it two steps. Uh, just to kind of speed things up. So what should happen is that the instant that it touches the code, uh, the little candy, the dog will stop and go into the surprised looking mode. Okay, so uh, so how's that? Uh, make sense? Okay, so if you've got any questions uh, up to here, go ahead and uh, either shout it out in the Discord or... Um, uh, paste it in the, uh, put it in the stream chat on Twitch. All right. Um, okay, so what, uh, I'll just wait and see if anybody's typing anything, but what I'm going to do now is we'll take uh, the heart candy and we'll make it so that when the dog touches it, it does something. So let's go here, and right now the heart candy has no... Um, no uh, code associated with it. So we'll go to events and see what different options we have. So we have when the green flag is clicked, when a key is pressed, when the sprite is clicked, so that would be useful in games or something, when the backdrop switches, when volume is something, when I receive messages, and we'll talk about messages later, but there isn't anything here that says when uh, an object or a different sprite touches me. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to say, okay, when the green flag is clicked, let's continually check over and over until the, uh, the dog is touching it. Okay, so I could do, for example, wait until, and then under sensing, wait until the dog is touching the heart shape, okay? And then what do we want to do once the um, once the, the thing is touched? Well, perhaps we could do, um, maybe we could do this. Um, let me just put some things in here. Let's see. Next costume. Um, wait a second. Next costume. Okay, so the the heart candy has four costumes. Okay, and so then I can just make it so that uh, once the thing touches, um, uh, once the thing touches the the heart, it will uh, make the um, uh, the heart change costume. Okay, so the question was. Um, the uh, I'm a little behind on the dog code. How did you get the counter inside of the if then? All right, so let me go back to the dog code. So I'm assuming that you mean this little part right here, Zach, that's in green. So um, I have under variables, I defined a counter. And sorry, the dog is going nuts. Um, so she's very sweet. Um, and Mike, I've, I've, I'll answer your question in a second. Uh, okay, so if I wanted to make a formula that involved the counter, then I just have to drag the counter uh, from my sort of code palette and put it into my code somewhere. So for example, if I wanted to add five to that, I could have an adi the counter plus five, and there I go. Um, Okay, so Zach, does that make sense how I was able to get the counter? I 
could even put in like background music and stuff. Um, or like the Jeopardy theme song. Uh, okay, so while while I'm waiting for Zach to, to tell me if that's uh, that answers his question or not, Mike, your question is why until touching dog two you think it should touch the heart candy? It's dog two because which code am I editing? I'm editing the code for the heart candy. Well, the heart candy can't is always touching the heart candy. So the reason that I'm having the heart candy checked if it's touching dog two is because this is the code for the heart candy not for the dog. Um, so that's the distinction there. Okay, so Mike, hopefully that answers your question. And, okay, so Zach, you think you're good? Okay, Mike, good. Um, okay, so, and, and Devin is in the Discord text chat. If anybody needs him, he's, uh, he's trying to do double duty and be in voice chat for his senior studio. So, okay, so let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so the cat and the dog are doing their thing, no big deal. Okay, so when the, um, when the, uh, uh, heart is touched by the dog then it starts to rotate through its different um, uh, different options uh, okay so um, now in this case uh, in a video game one of the things that we just did here we'll have to be a little bit careful with which is namely that the dog and the cat are sort of both or sorry the dog and the candy are both checking simultaneously whether or not they are touching each other and um, sometimes that can cause problems in a game so like let's say for example uh, if one thing touches another uh, then uh, it deletes something or uh, causes the game to end so like let's say you touch a monster or something then um, then uh, because the t the checking whether or not two objects are touching doesn't happen simultaneously uh, sometimes you can get kind of weird behavior um, but messaging is a way to take care of that and we'll talk about um, it in the uh, not too distant future so okay so let's um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about messaging uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm just going to delete the cat entirely um, from the project and uh, that way we'll kind of um, uh, clean things up and I'm going to stop the execution uh, of the program by hitting the red uh, stop sign uh, because uh, just because um, and then let's uh, let's throw in another sprite and let's find something kind of uh, exciting um, that looks sort of interesting um, so let's see, I'm not sure what I'm looking for here. Hmm. Uh, here, how about the rainbow? Um, okay, so a couple things. So let me take the rainbow and notice how if I drag the rainbow around, it is on top of uh, both the dog and the... Um, uh, the heart candy and that's because I created that particular sprite um, uh, after I created the dog and the candy but I can move it so let me go to events so we'll have when green flag is pressed under looks I'm going to um, send it backwards okay to the back layer and if I run that then now, oops, why is that not, oh, there we go. It's because I dragged it. Uh, now the rainbow will, will sort of automatically be in the background, and um, so I won't be able to, uh, or so the dog will be in front of it. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to do is let's, um, let's actually change the size of this thing to, uh, well, maybe that's a little bit big. How about that? 
Okay, and I'm going to put it kind of here and then run that so that it's behind everything. Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that uh, the uh, rainbow is initially hidden. Okay, and I can do that by putting a hide. And so now the rainbow is there, it's just invisible. Okay, um, and uh, then how, what do I want to do to make it uh, to reappear? Well, let's take, for example, uh, the instant that the dog touches the, um, the candy. Okay, so let me go to my dog code. So what happens when the dog touches the candy? Well, this repeat loop here will keep running, and it only stops once the dog touches the heart candy. Otherwise, it keeps running. And when it stops, the code moves on to the next thing, which in this case, there's only one thing that happens, which is changing the dog's costume uh, to the sort of... Uh, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here for a second. Uh, so the question was, uh, is there a way of putting the rainbow behind the green, or can you only put it behind the dog and the heart? Um, there is not a way to put it behind the green and the stuff, because that's a background. Um, if I wanted to make it appear that it was behind the cloud or the, uh, the trees, um, then I would have to... Um, make that backdrop actually a sprite and do kind of some graphics effects sort of thing. Um, yeah, so the reason it uh, can't go behind the, the green and the blue part is because the green and the blue stuff is a background and nothing can be behind the background. Um, so good question. Uh, okay, so anyway, the, uh, the dog, when it touches the candy, it switches to the surprised look and that's it. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that the dog, when it touches the uh, candy, tells the rainbow to become uninvisible, so to show itself. Uh, okay, and so this is uh, sort of a first example as to how we can get a um, one sprite to send information to uh, or from uh, a different uh, uh, sprite, okay? Um, okay, so to do that, what we're gonna do is under events, we have broadcast messages and we have receive messages. So we'll say broadcast message and then each message can have its own name and I'll make this one one, uh, let's say dog candy uh, to indicate that the dog has touched the candy. And uh, if I were to run the code right now, absolutely nothing different would happen. The dog would broadcast the message candy, or dog candy, but nothing is set to receive or do anything if that happens. Um, uh, so, uh, Tyler, the, the, um, the sprites are not locked in the order you make them, but if I click on one, then it becomes the top layer right so see how like if I click the candy it goes in front of the dog and if I click the dog it goes in front of the candy uh, so if you move them around on the screen then they they move all the way to the front layer and then uh, let me unhide the um, the rainbow um, so if I drag the rainbow around, he'd be in front, and if I move him back, then I would have to pop these guys, drag them to move them in front, or do what I did with the rainbow, which is send it either to the back layer or the front layer, or if we go back to looks, I can set it, um, you've got a back layer and a front layer, uh, and then there's however many... Um, how many layers in between depends on how many sprites you want to have. So you can send it either forward or backwards the appropriate number of layers to get everything to look right. Um, okay, so uh, so let me rehide the uh, the um, the rainbow. Okay, so uh, the dog will say uh, will broadcast dog candy. Uh, 
and then we need to make the rainbow receive that message. So on the rainbow, we'll have an event when I receive dog candy, then do something. Okay, and what should we have the rainbow do uh, when uh, when it receives this message? What do you think uh, we could do here, guys? Okay, we could make it just appear, so let's start with that. Uh, so then I would just have show. Um, okay, so what this means here is that... Um, we have sort of two independent blocks of code now within the rainbow, and uh, one of them, the hide and go to the back layer, will execute when the green flag is pressed, so that's when the program starts. And the other one, uh, to make the rainbow visible, will only display when it receives the dog message. So what this means, or a number of things that it means, is um, your code, you uh, when you add more and more stuff, there's going to be a lot of different things here, and it can be real easy to get them mixed up and disorganized and stuff like that. So one thing you can do to keep things tidy is if you right-click and you say clean up blocks, then Scratch will kind of automatically arrange the code blocks uh, along a grid and make it a lot easier to read. Uh, I personally wish that it would organize things horizontally. I think that's easier to read. Um, but that's my preference. So just uh, try and keep your code clean. Uh, the other thing is if I right click on a block of code, I can add a comment and I can say uh, this stuff happens only when the dog sends the dog candy message. So comments uh, which in this stuff is, um, and uh, hang on, Zach, I'll go back to that in a minute. Uh, comments, so in this case, it's sort of on like a, a little post-it note, which you can expand or contract to kind of make it easier to read. Uh, comments don't actually affect the code in any way. Uh, all they do is they're there for you as the person coding or me as the person reading and looking at your code. Um, so it's uh, really important that you comment uh, things as much as possible and also reasonable. You don't want to overly comment things. Um, just to, to help yourself keep track of what's going on, but also to help somebody else who's going to read your code uh, go on. Okay, so let's go back to the dog code for just a moment and answer Zach's question. So go ahead, Zach. What's, uh, what's the la question? Okay, so Mr. DeFrenza, I got the comment by right-clicking on something and then hitting add comment. Uh, okay, so Zach, what's your question with the dog code? Mon plaisir, monsieur. Yes, now I can hear you. That's great. So what's your question? Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, green stuff, so you see how it's all color-coded, green things are here under operators. So I had to kind of build this up. I needed an equal checker and a mod checker and then the counter variable. So I just drag those in and then I 
drag the counter and plop him into the socket. Counter mod 2, plop that into that socket, and then I was interested in when that was equal to 0. That gave me my, my sort of Boolean. Um, a Boolean object is something that's only true or false, which in Scratch is represented with the pointies, uh, pointy diamond things. And then I just plopped, yep, and then I just plopped that in the if condition. Yeah, I can hear you, Zach. Go ahead. So when I created the if then, it had the little empty socket. And then all I got to do is drag that. And you see how the, the outline kind of highlights white. Then that tells you it's going to get socketed in there. And plop, and there we go. So, good, Zach? We oui, uno. All right, well, uh, I'll assume that's okay, and uh, if not, we'll come back to it. All right, so this thing right here, I made a second copy of it, uh, but how did you get the counter mods 2 equals 0 in the if then? Mine stays rounded, not diamond. Oh, uh, because I've got the equals 0 part. So what I think you're talking about is if you put that, if you put this in the if then, you can't do it because this is a round object, which is a number, not a true false. So you have to put, so I had to build this thing, and it's maybe a little hard to see from you guys, but you see um, you see how the, the counter mod 2 has kind of a black line around it. I had to socket that into the equal statement, then socket it into the if thing. So you have to build it up kind of piece by piece. Um, and this illustrates uh, something that, that is kind of important in computer science, which is data types. So um, uh, in, we, we've talked about this, and you guys are working on the integer encoding and the floating point encoding and that sort of stuff, that um, you have to make sure that you know what kind of data you're dealing with. Uh, and... Uh, Python is kind of bad about this because it sort of makes it easy to not remember what kind of data um, you're dealing with. Is it an integer? Is it a floating point number? Is it a true-false thing? What? Um, in Scratch um, and several other languages that are kind of like it, uh, the convention is pointy objects are true-false, round objects are numeric, and... Um, Scratch doesn't make any difference between integer and floating point. Um, that's just its uh, its convention for simplicity. I mean, try explaining integer versus floating point to a six-year-old. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so let me get rid of this and get rid of that. And let's go back to the rainbow code. So now uh, what I did was we just said, all right, when it receives the message from the dog called dog candy uh, show the rainbow and that's it okay so let's run this and see what happens okay there we go all right so uh, so let's make this a little bit more exotic and um, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to still I'm going to still send it to the back layer, but instead of hiding, I'm going to use a t an effect. And the effect I'm going to use is called the ghost effect. Okay, so if I run this, ghost effect of zero basically uh, makes the thing look oops uh, looks exactly the same as it always does. But watch what happens when I set the ghost effect to 50 and I execute this. So you see how it uh, becomes a little bit transparent? If I set the ghost effect to, say, 25, 
it's still transparent, but not by as much. If I set it to 75, you almost can't even see it. And if I set it to 100, it doesn't appear there at all, so it's hidden. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the ghost effect as a way to make something fade in or out. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to get rid of that. So to be clear, the rainbow is showing, uh, but it's showing at 100% transparency. So you don't actually see it even though it, it is there on the screen. Okay, and then when we receive dog candy, I'm going to do something kind of fun. I'm going to repeat 10 times to change the ghost effect by minus 10. Okay, and the reason it's minus 10 in not 10 is uh, the ghost effect starts at 100. That means fully transparent, and I want the thing to fade in. And uh, so now, let me run this and you can see what happens. So you saw how it very quickly faded in? That happened 10 times. So um, that was maybe a little bit too fast. So what I can do to kind of slow it down, well, I could, for example, make it happen 100 times, but go by minus 1 each time. And if I run that, you see it fades in much more slowly. Okay, so um, so you can kind of experiment with that. The other thing you can do is you can put in a wait command here. So if I, uh, this would be a little ridiculous uh, to wait a second each time. Um, so, oops, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to run this and then run that. Okay, so it would fade in very slowly because it's only changing the transparency effect by one or negative one really every second so it would take a hundred seconds for this to fade in that's maybe a little ridiculous so why don't we make this say 0.1 seconds so it's a little faster okay and now it would take 10 seconds uh, to fade in, which maybe that's too slow, maybe that's too fast. You can adjust the speeds by um, changing, say, the amount that it changes by each step or adjusting the wait time. So if I do that, it should be only five seconds. Oops. Um, okay, maybe that's a little bit more reasonable. Um, okay, so good so far? Yeah, so any questions on the uh, this sort of ghosting effect, then um, let uh, go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, is there a way to set an action to start like after a minute or something along those lines? Uh, yes. So, for example, here, if we wanted the rainbow to fade in after a specific amount of time, rather than after waiting to receive the message dog candy, what I could do is I could say uh, something like, um, when green flag is clicked, wait, say, 30 seconds, and then do the uh, rainbow fade in. So this way, the rainbow would fade in after 30 seconds, regardless of what happens between the dog and the candy. Uh, if I take this little chunk of code that I'm kind of moving around, and I put that up here, then that would only trigger when the dog sends the message. So uh, you've got a couple different options there. Um, for how you get things timed. Uh, the other thing we could do is actually under the dog, we could say, for example, when green, green flag is clicked, wait 30 seconds and then broadcast the, the dog command. Okay, so if I run this now, um, it waited a second. Oh, I'm sorry, the reason that didn't work is because 
Oh, because I had the uh, wait 30 seconds here. So let me remove that. That's my bad. Um, so if I say, let me just make this wait five seconds so that we can kind of see it. Then the dog waited five seconds from the green flag being clicked and then sent the message to the rainbow. Um, this... Um, yeah, so there's a couple of uh, couple of ways you can do it. Uh, for uh, keeping your code organized, uh, one thing that's good is if you've got things that where there needs to be waiting a particular amount of time so that one sprite does something and then you wait another amount of time for another sprite to do something, uh, broadcasts and keeping all of those pieces of code in the backdrop code uh, can be a good way to keep it sort of organized so that, because uh, when you're when your code gets more complicated, you got more sprites and whatnot. Uh, it can be a little tough to uh, uh, to keep track of everything. Okay, so let's go back to the rainbow code for a moment, and uh, I've got the ghost effect going on, uh, but I wanted to show you that there are other effects that you can play with under looks. So uh, the rainbow doesn't have two different costumes. Um, we can switch backdrops and costumes. We can change the size. Uh, we can also change uh, the color effect, or fisheye, or whirl, or pixelate, or mosaic, brightness, or ghost. You can have kind of fun with these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the color effect by one each time. And so let's run that and see what happens. Okay, so what's happening is that the... Um, uh, the, uh, and I'm actually going to move, uh, this here, uh, the color effect basically makes it look sort of trippy, and I'm going to duplicate this bit and put it here, and then remove the part about the ghost effect. Okay, so now let's watch, uh, Watch what happens. Let's move the dog back over here, and there we go. Okay, so again, after five seconds, the um, yeah, so we get kind of the trippy effects there. Um, now, one thing I wanted to point out here is notice that we have two pieces of code that are sending the message to uh, broadcast dog candy. Uh, we've got one that happens when the dog touches the candy, and the other one that I added here to answer Mr. DeFrenza's question. Um, I'm going to delete this one uh, and only have the dog touching the candy trigger anything. Um, why? Um, basically just because I want to. Um, in general, uh, you it is okay to have multiple things triggering uh, the same message. So say, for example, uh, let's say we're making a game and there's two different kinds of monsters. And if your player touches either kind of monster, then uh, the game should be over. Well, then you might have each monster's code say, if I'm touching the player, then send the message game over. And... Um, that would be good because you don't necessarily know which monster would be uh, triggering it. So uh, anyway, okay, so let's uh, let's just kind of run the final product here. Let's move our dog back. And um, then when it touches the candy, then our rainbow fades in. We get the trippy colors on the heart, and the rainbow is going to kind of do this color effect, and both of those things are going to happen forever. Um, and I could have made this a lot more ridiculous. So, for example, under the rainbow code, I've got it waiting. If I put that weight away and say, ramp this up, then I can get, like, disco party going on. Um, and so you can have a little bit of fun with this uh, if you if you kind of want to make it uh, trippy. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll put that back just so that I don't induce seizures in anybody. Um, 
Okay, so uh, any questions on, on this simple little project so far? Um, so one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to say simple dog animation. I'm going to make that my um, uh, the name of the project. And uh, then one thing, and then I'm going to save it just to make sure. Um, one thing that uh, you guys are going to need to do is, so you see next to the name, I've got this button that says share. If you do not see a share button when you're working on a project, it means that you have not verified your email address with Scratch. So check your email, check the spam folder. Um, it's there somewhere. Uh, or have it resend if necessary. So you cannot share a project until you um, um, until you've got a verified email address. Once you do, you will have this option. So projects by default are unshared, and that means that only you can see them. When you hit share, it will show you uh, a window that looks like this where you can put instructions or notes and credits. Okay, so for example, here I could say, this is my silly dog animation for CSC 101. And then uh, under notes and credits, think of this as kind of like a work cited. So when we're making animations and video games and things like that, uh, it's quite likely going to be the case that you're going to use things that other people have created. Uh, art, sound, things of that sort, and that's totally okay. Um, you just, it's a good idea to credit them. So you could say, for example, I used sprites uh, from scratch, and let's say I also uh, used Dude Bro's awesome tutorial. Thanks, Dude Bro. Um, so, like, let's say, for example, that you look at somebody else's project on Scratch, either one of your classmates or any of the thousands upon thousands of users that are out there. Uh, if you get a good idea from somebody, um, cite them, right? It's That's uh, how this stuff is supposed to work. Um, and then you can set commenting to be on or off. Uh, you can add a studio, which um, I don't have a studio set up. You can copy the link to the project, um, and this is how you could, for example, tell me, like let's say you're you're having trouble with the project, then you could copy paste that in, and then uh, you could do it. So I'm going to actually take that copy copy that link real quick, and I'm going to go to into our Canvas page, and I'm going to edit the home page and start putting. Um, uh, scratch things so so I'm gonna put the link to that there and then I'm gonna bold that and oops that's not what I meant to do I meant to bold those okay so now if you guys click on this link here, then, um, so let me actually do something that I should never do, which is use Microsoft Edge. Okay, so I'm going to, and then I'm going to switch OBS here um, to, um, okay, so the screen is going to go blank for just a second. Um, okay, why is that still blank? Uh, hang on one second, guys. Um, okay, I'm not sure why Edge isn't showing up. I'll mess with that in a member. Yeah, I know. I'm the worst streamer ever. Thanks, Devin. Um, okay, anyway, what I wanted to do, though, was just open it in a different web browser um, or um, 
uh, actually I guess I could probably do this is uh, open a um, a private tab um, yeah let's app open an incognito window um, yeah so uh, I, I just opened an incognito window um, and you still don't see it. Okay, so that's my bad. I'll I'll fuss with the edge later. Okay, but anyway, uh, if you um, if you load up somebody else's project, yeah, 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 you guys are being jerks. You guys are such a third derivative position. Gosh. Uh, so anyway, um, then um, if you go to see inside. That takes you back to the code uh, stuff. And if you look at anybody else's code, uh, then you can see their code and kind of see how it works uh, or uh, make a copy of it yourself. So, um, so let me save this and let's just go back to the Scratch main page and um, just kind of pick, uh, pick some, you know, kind of silly... Uh, uh, animation or silly game here, right? So this guy's whack-a-mole thing, and so you can see, um, uh, you know, the different instructions as to how you're supposed to run it, uh, and notes and credits. So he's basically, you know, uh, giving credit to people that helped him out or whatever. Okay, uh, if you click see inside, then you can see all of the code in here. And uh, it's not particularly tidy, obviously, uh, and you'll notice that there's not a whole lot in the way of commenting, so it's a little hard to read, but you can make a remix of it, and the remix means that now I have this person's code, his entire project, in my account, and I can edit things however I want, so I could clean things up, or I could change the graphics or things of that sort. Um, so this can be useful when you're kind of doing some experimenting. Um, it's important to always cite who you're using and always cite their ideas. It's also important that when you're making your game and stuff that I don't want you guys just remixing somebody else's game and uh, tweaking it. I want you to build your own thing from scratch. But that said, um, nobody programs in a vacuum. Right, and so if I am programming something, I am constantly looking at other people's code or code I've written in the past or documentation or examples uh, to remind myself how something works. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, provided that you're just being, you know, reasonable, a reasonable human about it. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, so just a reminder: if you do not see the share button up here. That means that you um, you have not verified your email address, and that's that's bad. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, I'll post the details to Canvas for uh, what you guys are supposed to do here. But um, let me just go to my um, my uh, various projects here, and um, let me take uh, this for example. Okay. So here's a silly animation I made um, back when I was uh, probably teaching uh, this class before. And so I was trying to demonstrate sort of, well, how could we recreate the Pixar, um, the Pixar Studio animation? And, uh, and then I was also kind of trying to show how bouncing would work. Um, I was messing with things. And of course, you guys remember in the Pixar animation, the... Uh, the, the lamp sort of scratches or hops on top of the eye and then it squishes the eye and looks all funny. Um, so um, uh, so that little animation or, uh, for example, I've got, um, let's take some other things here. Um, oh, here's my Pong game. Uh, and so some of these I'll share with you guys so you can see them. But... Um, uh, so yeah, this, uh, this doesn't do anything right now. It's kind of broken still. Um, but what, what y'all's basic first project is going to be with, um, with Scratch is to make a simple, 
uh, studio animation. So, uh, for example, let me load up YouTube here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to load up this video here. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the various intros to Valve's um, uh, video games. And uh, these are ludicrously simple because it's just basically like a dude with a valve on his head. And then, you know, maybe it says what game engine they're using or something. Okay, so um, maybe some more complicated ones would be like the 2K games intro. 2K. Okay, which has um, some audio and lots of things diff getting animated and stuff like that. Um, and we could look at some other ones. So like Ubisoft has a good one, for example. Okay, um, so basically y'all's first project is to make a, uh, uh, make up a, uh, a studio animation um, and make up sort of the name of your game studio. Uh, and this will be sort of the first step into um, a, um, the first step into our project. Uh, this shouldn't take that long, and I'll post the details to it um, on uh, Canvas. Um, but basically, uh, it, I'll give you guys basically about a week. I don't think you'll really need much more than that. It's not rocket science. Um, you, uh, the, the specifications for it is it needs to have certain components. It needs to have some audio. It needs to have things that are moving around. It needs to have some sort of logo. And... Um, uh, then a few other things which I'll, I'll specify uh, on Canvas. And when will I make it due? Um, how about Friday night? How's that sound, guys? This week. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, no, I'll give you guys until next week um, to, to get that cracking. Um Okay, so um, I wanted to also walk you through one other thing, uh, and I'll, I'll post the details. Don't worry, it won't be until next week, uh, but you guys will need to get kind of cracking on it because this stuff does not happen instantaneously. All right, so let me go back to OBS, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to do uh, window capture and Discord. Okay, okay. So let me resize this so that everybody can see it. Um, transform fit to screen. Okay. Uh, all right. So now what you see is uh, our Discord chat, and uh, the reason I brought this up is I wanted to make sure that uh, your your uh, you guys know one of the features that. Uh, Discord allows us to do that'll be very useful is if um, uh, and it, it won't let me do this because I'm currently uh, transmitting on uh, Twitch but um, uh, Devin can you um, go live um, Okay, so if you notice in the uh, in the chat window here on the left, it says that Devin is live, and if you click join stream, what will happen is you'll actually be able to see Devin's computer screen, uh, and uh, you can also hear him. So if you click join stream, uh, you, this is how we'll share screens back and forth. So like, let's say that you guys have a question about how uh, to do something in Scratch, or you've got your code and you want to show it to one of us, there's two ways you can do that. You can either live stream it, and we can talk through things together, uh, or you can um, you can uh, share the project on Scratch and paste in the link, and then we can look at the code on our own computer. So, uh, yeah, so I can't go live at the moment because I'm already live on uh, Twitch, uh, but you'll you'll have that ability um, 
to go live and then uh, then I could join you or one of the guys can join you and we can look at uh, look at your code on your screen. Um, so that's pretty easy to do. Maybe uh, what I would suggest is play with that uh, today or tomorrow to kind of get a sense for how the live part works, just to, to kind of make sure that you're good. Um, the reason I'm not using the, the stream here in Twitch uh, for class is because it's not recorded, and uh, so I can't save that or upload it for anybody who's not in class today, and there are like seven or eight people that aren't here today. Um, so yeah, just because we're going online for teaching, you guys still have to show up for class. Um, dude bros um, okay so uh, let's go back to Chrome um, and let's go back to canvas okay so I'll post the, the assignment in here um, and just so that we're all on the same page we do have a few other assignments that are um, um, extra credit you're here uh, no because you didn't put an apostrophe in weir so as far as I'm concerned, you were here, but you're not here anymore. So yeah, hashtag liberal arts college. Um, okay, so just to make sure that we're clear, you've got the integer encoding, floating point encoding, uh, iteration and recursion. And uh, now that I know that we're gonna be virtual for the rest of the semester, I'm gonna have to come up with a B plan on the basic skills exam and the final because obviously um, that's not gonna work so well anymore. Um, so I'm still kind of thinking through some ideas and I'll get back to you guys. Um, I was kind of hoping that we would be able to bring everybody back um, um, bring everybody back to campus um yeah okay so reese for the the projects um well so since you guys are all no longer on campus uh it's a little hard for me to um um a little hard for me to uh make you guys put all the parts back in their little buckets so you guys are off the hook on that and i'll put the xr project grades in um they went fine so i think everybody is uh Everybody turned it in. Everybody's stuff worked as well as physics would allow, and so we're all we're all Gucci. Um, oh, um, well, I guess Devin thinks I should fail everybody. Um, so sorry, guys. I guess you all fail. Um, okay, so <laughs> well, you can blame the coronavirus, Devin. Um, don't worry about it. So, all right. So we'll end the stream here, and uh, I'll post the specifications for the project to Canvas, and um, um, uh, and then we'll get cracking on that. And on Friday, we'll start talking about uh, a couple of concepts called scope and cloning. Um, and actually, we'll do uh, kind of as an example. Um, let me just show you guys something. Uh, uh, you guys might have seen this particular story from the Washington Post going around recently where it tries to simulate the transmission of the coronavirus using these dots as sort of representations. Uh, and it does a simulation as to, okay, what happens if you have one infected person and there's, say, a couple of hundred people uh, and they're all kind of wandering around, then people get sick people get over the disease and so you get a disease spread curve that looks kind of like that thing at the top um, but one of the things that we can do Friday is actually start to program a little simulation that's kind of like uh, kind of like this and uh, it'll be a little harder to get this sort of graph up at the top going um, but this uh, this sort of thing where you've got dots all of them looking the same but then you've got different colored dots uh, representing sick or healthy or recovered individuals, um, we can actually program that thing without too much trouble. Um, and uh, I think that will be a good, a good way to illustrate the idea of cloning and uh, uh, the idea of scope of variables. Uh, so that's what we'll pick up on Friday. So uh, in the meantime, um, just hang in there and keep calm and code on. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end the stream now. And uh, I'll see you guys on Twitch. I mean, uh, uh, Discord.